Hello, everybody. Great to be uh, with you. And uh, I can see from the numbers, you know, a couple of hundred people already, and we're building up as we go. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. We've got a great panel for you. And it's a wonderful topic. It's a topic that really uh, stimulates the imagination. Uh, I found back in Australia, uh, whenever you talk about space, particularly among young people, it's incredible how responsive they are. And we've got a panel tonight that's going to inspire you, they're going to educate you, and they're going to excite you. So there you go, panel. You've got, you've got a big task ahead of you. Um, and uh, let me begin by acknowledging our event partners, the Australian Space Agency, the CSIRO, Austrade, the Australian Consulate LA, and our digital host, the American Australian Association. Thank you to John Berry and his team for bringing all of this together. Now, Australia and the United States have been collaborating on space well before the first mission to the moon. And today we're discussing the next frontier in the Australia-US relationship. It may seem like a long time ago, but last September, our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, in his state visit announced that the Australian government intended to join the US Moon to Mars Exploration Program. And we're honoured to host one of our panellists, Dr. Megan Clark, during the signing ceremony of the agreement. Now, almost a year of the day, we have brought together leaders in the field to discuss how we're making this partnership a reality. Australia's space industry is underpinned by world-class universities, a highly skilled workforce, strong international links. We benefit from our strengths in communications technology, robotics, automation, data analysis. The government predicts that the industry will be worth $12 billion by 2030 and create up to 20,000 new jobs. I'm looking forward to hearing from Dr. Megan Clark tonight and alongside our space agency, our premier science agency, the CSIRO, a key research innovation delivery partner for our space sector. And I'm delighted to welcome the CSIRO CEO, Dr. Larry Marshall. I also extend a warm welcome to Larry James, Deputy Director of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Great to have you with us, Larry. Thank you for what you're doing. And our moderator for this evening is a longtime friend of Australia, Colonel Pam Melroy. Pam's the Director of Space Technology and Policy at Nova Systems in Adelaide. Uh, Pam is a former NASA astronaut, and she is an inspiration to many in this virtual room and beyond. So thanks again to everyone for joining us in the discussion. Over to you, Pam. Thank you, Ambassador Sinodinos. And um, I feel compelled to offer you uh, a warm welcome again to the United States. You've been here for a little while, but uh, with COVID, I know you haven't been able to get out and see our, our great country and, and meet, uh, meet all the people who are so anxious to meet you yet. Uh, so I just want to say how very welcome you are and, um, and how pleased we are to have you as the ambassador. And I look forward to spending uh, more time with you in the future. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing Dr. Megan Clark. She's the head of the Australian Space Agency and a director of Rio Tinto and CSL Limited. She's a member of the Australian Advisory Board of the Bank of America, Merrill Lynch. Dr. Clark chaired the expert reference group into the review of Australia's space industry capability that directly led to the formation of the Australian Space Agency. She was chief executive of the CSIRO from 2009 to 2014. And prior to CSIRO, she was a director at MM Rothschild and Sons in Australia and was vice president technology and subsequently vice president of health Health, Safety, and Environment at BHP Billiton from 2003 to 2008. She holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of Western Australia, and as I know well, she's a proud West Australian. She has a PhD from Queen's University in Canada and is a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Technology and Engineering, a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Mining and Mineralogy, and a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors. In 2014, she was appointed a Companion of the Order of Australia. Over to you, Megan. 
Thanks very much, Pam, and uh, it's wonderful to be here. I'm coming to you today from Ngunnawal country, um, here in, in Canberra, and uh, the Ngunnawal people were great astronomers, and they told wonderful stories of the emu racing across the, uh, the night sky, right across our Milky Way down here in, uh, in, southern, in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, thanks so much to Arthur Sinodinas. Ambassador Sinodinas was the minister that led the push for the Australian um, Space Agency. And I will always be, uh, be forever grateful for all of the work that you did uh, for that to happen, um, Ambassador. Uh, Commander Melroy um, always uh, gives me orbital corrections, but only when, uh, only when needed. So uh, really appreciate the support that you've given um, to Australia in this, uh, in this push and, and as we move forward. And it's just fantastic to uh, to be here with Larry Marshall and also Larry James. Um, I'm really I'm really um, honoured um, and pleased to be able to uh, to join you um, tonight, your time and early morning our time. I wanted to do a couple of things um, very quickly in this sort of brief intro. Was just give you an update on how the Australian Space Agency is laying the foundations um, for how we can transform and grow the Australian space industry here. Uh, and we cannot do that without our uh, collaborations internationally, um, without our partners um, such as the US. And we really want to inspire Australia and make a difference to, to the lives um, of all Australians in how we use space in our everyday. Um, I, uh, I also wanted to update you um, as uh, the ambassador outlined on how we will again stand shoulder to shoulder um, with our partners, uh, the United States, um, on going further on the moon and, and on to Mars. And it, um, I'm, you mentioned it was just a year ago, um, Ambassador, it's, it's a year ago this week um, that our Prime Minister announced that uh, um, we would join, rejoin the, the US in those endeavours. And uh, uh, wow, what, what a lot's happened as well in that, in that year. So I'll give you a bit of an update on how we're making that real, as the Ambassador said. Um, and we're already seeing some, some wonderful momentum uh, and, and real growth down here of the sector. So already we have a capital pipeline of some $2 billion uh, of investment going into the space sector. And just over 700 million of that is coming from industry and international. So there's quite a bit, uh, a bit of momentum. If I go to the next slide, let me just start with um, our purpose, just to sort of give you uh, a bit of grounding in what we're trying to do. We, our purpose really is to transform and grow um, a globally respected space industry here in Australia. And um, we, want, we want it to help diversify and lift the economy. This becomes so important in a post COVID um, era and we have a role to play there. And of course we want to inspire and improve the lives of all Australians. So it's a very um, commercially focused um, purpose and that purpose as well as our values kind of guide and thread through everything that we do. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll just give you a quick update on the priority areas. We're not a, we're a, we're not a big country, um, so it's really important that we uh, have our effort focused. We've set seven civil space priority areas and, uh, and we're really trying to focus our efforts on those. They make sense for Australia uh, and they lean on our competitive advantages, but they also, you know, we're not limiting our vision. We really think we can stretch ourselves um, in several areas. Position navigation and timing, which is led by Geoscience Australia Agency here. And that will give us 10, 10 meters accuracy across our land and, um, and seaboard uh, jurisdictions, as well as uh, with the mobile phone network and towers, we'll be able to do additional corrections to bring us down to five centimeters um, precise uh, positioning in our cities. And, uh, whilst the 10 metres um, is not world leading, uh, having precise positioning in, in our cities uh, will certainly put us at, at, uh, um, at the, right at the edge there, which I think is great. And allow us to do things like robotics and all sorts of new It's activity um, in, in remote areas. Um, we're really looking at you know, optical communications, quantum, um, how we can support as well communications between the earth uh, moon, etc. Um, so uh, a lot of work going on there and, and uh, CSIRO, um, Larry's organisation is definitely helping us there. In the space situational awareness, we are already uh, a key node in the US network. 
but we're now looking to extend that as well into the civil uh, into the civil area. We we've just funded a project uh, using a passive radar with Silentium uh, uh, Defence, and uh, we're also starting to look at how we use even the radio astronomy uh, network. So some really exciting things happening there as we extend what we're doing in space situational awareness, um, and some and some great little companies coming on there. Um, leapfrog R&D, we're looking at things like hypersonics, as I mentioned, the quantum computing. Um, we're also looking at our space medicine and how we can support uh, the, uh, the efforts there. We, we, we kind of spend quite a bit of time in some very hostile and remote places, so we hope that uh, experience will be able to leverage uh, even further. In robotics, um, Australia has uh, some wonderful advantages in remote asset management. Um, just to give you a feel for that, you know, we manage areas bigger than 300 kilometres. We do all that from uh, from 1,600 kilometres away. Yeah, we lost you there for just a minute, Megan, but you see your connection looks good right now. Does it look good? Thank you very much. Sorry about that. Yes, it's it just does. not coming up on my screen yet. Um, so if you've still got the slides, I'm just running through, um, running through those. Um, and I just wanted to pause there and just also look at... Um, the uh, the area of access to space um, and Pam, can you can everyone see those slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, so well, we've got your priority area slide. No, no, no. Thank you, thank you for that. So I think that what's really important for us is we're looking at the sovereign ca um, capability too of launch, and it's a really important area, uh, and we see it having a lot of spin-offs in terms of jobs and companies, etc. Uh, we've got companies like Gilmore. Um, looking at small launch capability. We've got uh, a couple of locations um, pressing ahead, uh, companies such as Equatorial Launch Australia pressing ahead with the potential of Equatorial Launch, Southern Launch, um, looking at, uh, at polar and low Earth orbit um, launch. And so um, a, a pretty exciting area that's, uh, that's coming up uh, for us. Um, on our side, we updated our Space Act. We simplified our rules. Uh, we're now working with the companies and we're gearing up because the next step for us is, um, is how do we support this industry do 40, 50, 60 launches a year. So it's a pretty exciting, uh, exciting area. Um, we're laying the foundations, if you can go to the next, uh, next slide, we're laying the foundations for uh, sort of infrastructure. We thought this was really important in our early days. So mission control in Adelaide, which uh, that contract has now gone to Sabre Astronautics. We're setting up a robotics and automation and artificial intelligence command and control center in Perth, which will be run by Fugra Marine, uh, and a data analysis center with the Causey supercomputer in, uh, in West Australia. We've also updated the deorbit uh, tracking facilities um, over Tasmania, you know, sitting, uh, sitting down there in a great place to, uh, to do deorbit tracking. And we're now working through a couple of other um, infrastructure options, such as space manufacturing in New South Wales, um, and looking at what other test facilities. Uh, so that's an important step for us, just to lay some of those foundations which can support um, the industry. And then Moon to Mars. So if you can go to the next slide. And uh, it, it was so exciting um, just a year ago, announcing that 150 uh, million where we can stand you know, at the shoulder again of the US. Uh, it was just one one week ago, one year ago this week, and we're already now open for our first program on that, which uh, which the team is really proud of. Um, we certainly want to support the ambitions of the United States, uh, and we want to show what we can do and inspire our nation. So just going down to the detail of that, uh, how we're going to do that, um, I said our first program is already up and running, uh, and that is the supply chain piece of this. We'll do it in three stages, supply chain, we'll demonstrate um, Australian capability, and then we'll do a trailblazer project. So if there's any companies out there or people out, out there who um, are already looking to bring Australian know-how, Australian capability and technology into those global supply chains, we are already open for applications uh, in, that, uh, in that program. And the next stays it's really important that we demonstrate and support our researchers and industry to demonstrate their capability on orbit. Um, and then we're working through a number of areas with the NASA team for, uh, for a real tra trailblazer. So we've built a fantastic team down here. I'm, I'm grateful every day for this team. And we really want to lay the foundations. Um, we're only two years old. 
we want to strengthen that uh, US mateship and alliance, and we're, we're gearing up to, uh, to transform, the, transform the industry. So thanks, uh, thanks very much, Pam. Thank you so much, Megan. Uh, that's wonderful and exciting. And I know there's a lot of very big questions out there, but I'd like to uh, introduce our next panelist, Dr. Larry Marshall. Uh, Dr. Larry Marshall is the Chief Executive of CSIRO, Australia's National Science Agency and Innovation Catalyst. CSIRO solves the greatest challenges through innovative science and technology. Dr. Marshall, of course, is himself a scientist, a technology innovator and a business leader with a wealth of experience in creating new value and impact with science. He began his career as a scientist with a PhD in physics and became a global leader in laser research. Over 25 years spent in the United States, he evolved from scientist to inventor, to entrepreneur, to CEO, and finally to Silicon Valley Venture Capital. He's been the CEO and managing director and founder of six companies. He has 100 publications and conference papers, holds 20 patents, and has served on 20 boards of high-tech companies operating in the US Australia and China. He's passionate about innovation and the process of turning science into product and value. Dr. Larry Marshall. Thanks so much, Pam. Um, can I also begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of the land that I'm speaking from here today, who give us permission to leave our footprints um, side by side with theirs and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, you can go to the next slide, thanks. Arthur, it's fabulous to see you again, um, and especially to see you as a champion of all Australians in the United States. Um, Megan, great to see you also, and thank you for your inspiring words. We see our relationship as analogous to that between JPL and, and NASA, and I really look forward to hearing my old friend Larry James speak uh, shortly. It's terrific to be amongst friends and like-minded people today and really talk about space, but more broadly talk about how we can deepen that enduring relationship between Australia and the United States. We're gonna have the next slide. Australia, as Megan said, is growing a really vibrant um, space industry and it's underpinned by world-class space science, six times higher than the global average in case you were wondering. Um, and obviously a very long history in enabling space exploration, probably longer than many people realize. And we as an organization and myself personally, having grown up in the space era, um, I share Megan's ambition and passion to triple the size of the Australian space industry. Now, CSIRO um, has been in space for about 75 years um, and we're really in a great place to help support Megan's vision and really help launch Australia into this new area, particularly in the translation of breaking um, cutting edge technology into um, new companies. If I can have the next slide. Now, you probably all know that our partnership with NASA goes back to 1962, um, when our Parkes radio telescope, the DISH, was used to receive signals from NASA's um, Mariner 2 spacecraft. And it's also been called on many times since, most famously, of course, in the 1969 um, moon landing, which we celebrated the 50th anniversary of um, just recently. Maybe what you don't know, though, is some of the other things that Parks has done. If I could go to the next slide. Um, we're really proud to manage the Canberra Deep Space Communications Complex on behalf of NASA and JPL, um, and to continue to strengthen our partnership with the United States in space and exploration of space. But we tracked Voyager 2 throughout its journey across the solar system, being in the Southern Hemisphere, it's a very good place to track that journey. But in 2018, due to the United States budget shutdown, we actually had to break out and dust off the old beloved dish at Parks one more time because Voyager 2 was leaving the solar system for the final time going into interstellar space. We were able to track that and receive vital new data um, from literally the final frontier of space. If I can have the next slide. While our Parks facility was heritage listed just this year for its service to space exploration, Two of our more modern radio telescopes are being used to do follow-up research into gravitational waves caused by astronomical events of extraordinary scientific interest. And for a physicist, um, the discovery and the proof of the existence of gravitational waves 
just a few couple of years ago is one of the greatest discoveries of our century, maybe of all time for, for physics. Now, the world's first detection of gravitational waves was made possible by an extraordinary collaboration of scientists, thousands of them all across the world, led by a team in the United States. But each of those people around the world contributed something unique to the project, including those at CSIRO. We're gonna have the next slide. Something we learned in building this extraordinary instrument were the optical coatings had to be flatter than anything that was thought humanly possible to make before. And so the mirrors and many of the optics in the advanced LIGO system were actually invented and fabricated um, at CSIRO and then delivered, um, as were many of the sensitive instruments at ANU and other Australian universities. So it really was a team world discovery of gravity waves. And I mention that because space has got to be about team world. If we can't figure out how to collaborate together, bottle that amazing collaboration that delivered this breakthrough discovery, if we can figure that out, we will get to space a lot faster and we'll do it in a much more enduring way that takes everyone um, on the planet along on the journey. It's such an important mission for mankind and it's such an inspiration to our children and to future generations. So something we really all have to put our shoulders behind and support Megan at, at ASA and um, the team at NASA and JPL to really help drive this collaboration. If I could have the next slide. Um, it was just mid midway through last year um, when we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the dish and we were fortunate to have Ambassador Culverhouse from the US actually visit us at Parks and tell a few interesting stories about his own, own space journey. Um, we actually reenacted the landing um, literally at the time um, and the exact moment 50 years later that it happened. In September last year, as Megan mentioned, the Australian government um, committed to stand side by side with the US government and put $150 million into supporting the Moon to Mars program. We've also been a really significant um, amount of investment, as Megan said, in innovation and entrepreneurship through breakthrough space technologies. If we could have the next slide. In 2018, SARA made an initial investment of $16 million into what we call the Space Technology Future Science Platform, or Space FSP. It's a technology incubator designed to create cutting edge science, but then carry that across the valley of death to business and help build industries and startups. And Megan mentioned a couple of the ones that we have funded already. Um, SARA has some really unique experience in materials, advanced manufacturing, autonomous mining technologies, data analytics and health sciences. And we're bringing those together in a really focused way to help Megan and the team um, advance Australia's mission in space. Building on our expertise in optical mirrors that I mentioned for the LIGO detection of gravity waves, we're also working with the ANU on optical communications technologies for deep space, ultra high bandwidth um, communications links. And ANU are actually investigating optical quantum communications networks, including the development of a quantum optical ground station dedicated to space and optical communications. And they're really doing some groundbreaking work in this area in collaboration with us and others. In line with the, all of these investments and the progress in the breakthrough science, we're really seeing the rise of commercial space here in Australia. Something CSIRO's innovation fund, Main Sequence Ventures, has been actively investing in. One of our early investments was a spin out from the University of Adelaide um, called Miri Ota, and it's doing amazing things in the Internet of Things. And they offer a unique radio communication systems where the transmitter, which can last up to 15 years, communicates via satellites in low Earth orbit, enabling a device to communicate no matter where it is on the planet. So the ultimate in connectivity. You can see why we got excited enough to invest in this. It's built on Australia's strengths in communications technology, and I'm not just talking about the invention of Wi-Fi, although we're very proud of that, but Australia has some real strength in communications, as Megan mentioned. It's one of the areas we really want to push on for space. If I could have the next slide. Now, while we're out there shooting at the stars, we're already using space to solve some of our greatest challenges right here on the ground on Earth. Challenges like California is experiencing this year and like Australia experienced last year through bushfires and of course drought. Now, the fires were catastrophic and they made headlines all around the world. But as spring arrives in Australia, we have to prepare for the next fire season and we're doing that already as we're collaborating with our friends in California who are fighting, fighting their own fires at the moment. And we're really doing this by leveraging our research and our unique access to space and satellite data to understand, predict, and get ahead of bushfire conditions to track the fires and get to them before they grow out of control. 
we think there's a really great opportunity for collaboration with the United States and we're actively collaborating with CAL FIRE and CAL Canada on testing and evaluating the use of this satellite data to do just that, to predict and get in before and understand um, after a fire event. If I could have the next slide and I'm almost done. <laughs> um, satellite data can also be used and we are using it to actively monitor water. Um, we figure Australia is gonna need to grow probably twice the, the amount of crops it does currently with about half as much water as we use currently. And using our partners with the SmartSat CRC, a group of universities here in Australia, we're developing a whole new mission around water management and water conservation called AquaWatch. And the system uses real-time space data and predictive analytics and machine learning and AI to actually predict what is gonna to happen to the water, cast scenarios and figure out how to better use the water. It also, we think, can predict um, before it happens a, um, a, an event like a toxic blue-green algae bloom, as you may have heard of a fish kill event. We've had a few of those in the past in Australia. So these are just some examples of some real world challenges here on the ground that space is actually helping us to solve. And the missions program, which I announced a couple of weeks ago, is very much leveraging this type of technology and Australia's unique capabilities in space. If I could just have the last slide, thanks. Now, SORA works with every single university in Australia, just about every government agency and 3000 industry customers, both domestically and internationally, including many of the world's global fortune 500 people like Boeing, Microsoft, Jacobs, and so on. We're really committed to building the skills and networks needed to grow Australian capability in every aspect of innovation, but most particularly innovation in space. It's crucial um, that our investment in the next generation of people and skills really help carry this forward. And I can say from firsthand experience that Australia has some really eager future space pioneers. Now, I was fortunate enough to host Robert Lightfoot, the former leader of NASA back in 2017, to celebrate our 50 year partnership with NASA. And after he very kindly allowed me to be the first Australian agency head to sit at the same table alongside NASA and the European Space Agency, when the space agencies had their annual summit, he then went and uh, dragged me from pillar to post to about five different school children events. And you could not get Robert to leave a group of school kids talking passionately about space. And that's the passion and enthusiasm that an organization like NASA, JPL and our own ASA can really inspire. Questions I asked, how do we get to the nearest star? How will I be able to go on a holiday in space? When can I do that? It took me right back to being a child sitting cross-legged on the wooden floor of my old high school, my public school, infant school, sorry, watching the moon landing on a tiny black and white television. And that moment that ignited that fire of curiosity in my brain and in my heart that made me go and pursue a career in physics. It's that passion, that's, that's the fuel, not just the fuel that will get us to space, the fuel that will inspire many generations to come to really go build these breakthrough technologies and help us make our footprint on the stars. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Larry. And I have to agree with you. Certainly the Apollo program inspired me tremendously. And it's uh, amazing to think about um, the future, the Moon to Mars program, and the future leaders in both of our countries that that will inspire as well. I'd like to introduce our third uh, panelist, Lieutenant General, uh, United States Air Force retired Larry D. James, was appointed the Deputy Director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in August 2013. He's the laboratory's chief operating officer responsible to the director for the day-to-day -day management of JPL's resources and activities. Prior to his retirement from the Air Force, uh, Lieutenant General James was the Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff for Intelligence, Surveillance, and Recon Reconnaissance at the Pentagon. He was responsible to the Secretary and Chief of Staff of the Air Force for policy formulation, planning, evaluation, oversight, and leadership of Air Force intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. He led more than 20,000 intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance officers enlisted in civilians across the United States Air Force ISR enterprise. Lieutenant General James received his Bachelor of Science in uh, Air Astronautical Engineering from the Air Force Academy as a distinguished graduate and his Master of Science in Aeronautics and Astronautics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. 
He was also a Draper Fellow at the Charles Stark Draper Laboratory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, welcome, Lieutenant General Larry James. Well, Pam, uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction and certainly for Megan and Larry and, and Ambassador. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you. I mean, it's just such a tremendous partnership. It's such a wonderful event as our countries continue to work together to really advance the cause of space and exploration. And for me, it's just exciting to be a part of this team and uh, exciting to be a part of the future. So uh, if I could have the first slide, I just wanted to uh, really kind of walk through the broad picture of our partnership uh, over time and how enduring that has been. And then touch a little bit on our partnership with CSIRO and uh, finally, our partnership with the universities there across Australia. And all these are really keystones and, and legs of a tripod that, that make this relationship enduring and strong. You've already heard about the, uh, the signing of the agreement uh, about a year ago. There's a nice picture of Megan and uh, uh, our Deputy Administrator, Jim Moorhard. And uh, that is really setting the foundation for how we move forward. And Megan has talked about that. And they've talked about the new areas that can come along as well as the old areas. So deep space communication, uh, that's something that's been enduring over the last 50 years. Uh, remote operations and in, in situ resource utilization are new areas that we think can create strong bonds and strong partnerships with Australia. So there is that rich history. We're developing that overarching framework now, NASA and ASA, and that will again lead to future collaboration opportunities future industry opportunities. And you know it is just exciting to be a part of this broadening and deepening, deepening relationship. Uh, if I could have the next slide. So as I said, it's been a long history. Uh, Larry touched on this uh, with talking about uh, the dish, if you will, uh, at parks. But we really go back to uh, Woomera in uh, the late 50s and early 60s. That was the first site we started to use to start to track these deep space experiments that we were thinking about. Uh, he talked about the Apollo effort, and then we stood up uh, our first uh, major space communications complex outside of Canberra in 1965, the Deep Space Network. And that has been absolutely critical to accomplishing the missions that NASA and JPL have done, and really uh, other countries as well, because with this worldwide network, we are counted upon by other nations who are flying well beyond the Earth to communicate through our deep space network. So it's not just the US and Australia, but it's really a worldwide capability. Uh, a lot of science has been done there. You can see discussions on the very long baseline interferometry. Uh, we have been in the middle of re-engineering this entire network to bring it up to modern capability. And Australia and Canberra have been absolutely essential in that. In fact, we're right in the middle of re-engineering our big 70 meter antenna. Uh, some of the largest antennas uh, in the world to communicate with those missions like Voyager that Larry talked about. In fact, uh, Voyager 2 requires the, the antenna in Canberra. That is the only one that can talk to it. And while we've been refurbishing it, we have not been able to communicate with Voyager. So that gives us a little bit of trepidation. We put it in a nice safe mode, but uh, we absolutely rely on the capability there outside of Canberra to get that done. Next slide. And Larry touched a little bit on this, but I'm just gonna highlight some things where uh, parks and other capabilities were required in addition to the DSN. Uh, so when we were flying our Voyager spacecraft past Uranus, uh, we had to have parks to help supplement our DSN in 1986. The same thing happened when we flew by Neptune in 1989. And then of course, uh, communicating with Voyager 2 as it crossed that heliopause in 2018 becoming humanity's first interstellar spacecraft. So pretty historic event, uh, fully enabled by the capabilities there in Australia. And of course, uh, on our Galileo mission, we had an antenna failure. Parks was absolutely critical to allowing us to communicate to that spacecraft uh, despite that antenna failure. We've utilized the Robbery uh, Australian Telescope Compact Array to help us do science with our Cassini spacecraft, uh, looking through Saturn's rings and ionosphere. And of course, uh, as we have landed on Mars now multiple times, Parks has been critical, especially for our smaller Mars exploration rovers landing in 2003. So again, a rich history, absolutely essential, and something that we count on every day. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, Megan and Larry touched on this. Just a few thoughts as we think about the future. Uh, we talk about near-Earth objects 
potential asteroids that could hit the Earth. Uh, this is a, a very important task that uh, NASA has and others have to track those. And something that we've been demonstrating in Australia in the Southern Hemisphere is the ability to use the Deep Space Network, uh, blast uh, a signal out toward an asteroid and then capture that reflection at parks and the robbery. And we can measure that asteroid size, its distance, its speed. So those are the types of things, the new capabilities, the smart people are coming up with that allow us to use those existing capabilities. And of course, we're certainly excited about optical and quantum communication. As Larry said, that is an absolute strength of Australia. There's a, a multitude of opportunities there. We believe uh, we're building uh, the first deep space optical communication system that we're gonna fly on one of our spacecraft out to the asteroid belt. Uh, and that's just a first step in that future of deep space optical communication. Next slide. As I said, uh, we do a lot of partnership with CSIRO. I just wanted to highlight two of those very quickly. Uh, the first is in additive manufacturing. Some of you may know that as 3D printing, but we have been working alongside CSIRO uh, Clayton Lab uh, with Dr. Dan East there uh, to do that. And then another key area for us is improving batteries. Our spacecraft rely on batteries as they go further and further away from the sun. We have to have very long life. Uh, very compact, very powerful batteries, and we would like to move to a different style of battery like a sulfur battery, and we have been doing a lot of work there with Dr. Adam Best of CSIRO. So the next two slides will just touch on that with a little more detail. Next slide. We're going to get down a little bit into the technical weeds, but I think it's important to show the tremendous technical capability that exists across NASA and across CSIRO and ASA and the university system there in Australia. So this is looking at how do I make metals that have the characteristics of glass. We call those metallic, metallic glasses. So for us, it's very important because when we send a rover to Mars, you saw the picture in my first slide, uh, they're made, the gears are made of metal. You have to oil them to keep them from, you know, uh, not sticking over time. If you have something that has a glass characteristic, I no longer have to oil that because the friction stays low no matter long, how long you're operating them. So, we're very excited about this work and uh, the exchange program that's going on. Our principal investigator, Doug Hoffman, went out to Melbourne and uh, worked with the team there. And then Dan East from CSIRO came here this past summer, or last summer, uh, before COVID, uh, to, uh, to really spend the summer here and help us advance the state of the technology. So this has been just an absolutely critical partnership. Uh, both of us will benefit. We're utilizing the skills and intelligence of both organizations to come up with a great product that will benefit really all space programs. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other focus areas uh, are lithium sulfur batteries. Uh, we've all heard of the uh, lithium ion batteries and those uh, have been around a while, but frankly, they have some drawbacks and you kind of see there on the graph, I know I'm getting down into the engineering world, but uh, uh, the top line is kind of kilowatt hours or watt hours per kilogram. And you can kind of see where we are in the 2020s, but sulfur batteries have the opportunity to really drive us up that curve to increase the compact power of batteries for us and the longevity for us. But they've got problems in terms of the sulfur can kind of create uh, issues in terms of getting into the electrolyte. So figuring out how you solve that problem has been a desire of both our teams and the teams there in Australia, uh, both CSIRO and the industrial side of Australia. So you can see there, uh, Oxus Energy is uh, moving well along this path. They've developed some cells already that will, uh, we believe, potentially get up to 500 watt hours per kilogram, uh, which is uh, multiple times what we can do with lithium ion today. So extremely important work, uh, certainly benefits for the space program, but as you think about electric vehicles and all those sorts of things, potentially benefits across a whole host of uh, industrial manufacturing requirements. Uh, next slide. And then I just wanna to jump to our universities. Uh, this is a partnership we have with Queenlands University of Technology. And this is supporting our next Mars rover called Mars Perseverance. We launched that on July 31st. It's on its way to Mars right now. And it has a very exciting instrument called Pixel the Planetary Instrument for X-ray lith Lithochemistry. And what this does is it allows us to measure to a very, very fine level of detail the chemical composition of the various rocks and soil that the rover is driving around. 
but we need data analysis software to do that well. Uh, and, and we have some, but we want to improve that. And interestingly, the principal investigator on this is Abby Allwood, who is an Australian, uh, graduating from Macquarie University with her PhD there in Sydney. And so she is leading the charge for this instrument. It's one of the two critical instruments on our rover. And she is working with uh, QUT to help develop that software that will allow us to be much better and much more efficient in doing the data analytics for all the data that we're going to get back from that. Uh, so far, QUT is supporting one scientist for this. Of course, we'd like to have more. Uh, so uh, I will just put that plug out there that, uh, you know, if we have uh, a worldwide team helping us to do that, we can rapidly run through the data and make a lot of progress in doing this measurements for the nation and for the world. And frankly, it's pretty cool to be a part of a, uh, a Mars rover running around on the surface of Mars. In addition, uh, we've got some work going on in virtual reality. Uh, we think there's great partnership opportunities there. We can literally, based on the, what we see from the rovers and the pictures that we have, put a scientist on the surface of Mars. He feels like he's walking around where the rover is based on real data. And uh, I think that's a strength of Australia that uh, we could also partner in that area as well. Uh, next slide. We've also uh, been partnering uh, with the Australian National University on solar cells. Uh, as you might imagine, as you get further and further away from the sun with our missions, it's harder and harder to get enough power from the sun to power your spacecraft, so then we have to go to nuclear power, plutonium. But uh, Australia is doing a lot of great work in moving forward with uh, advanced solar cells that will allow us to really increase the power. You can see the goal there, four times the specific power compared to today's state of the art. And so, uh, uh, you know, we are working hard with your team at Australian National University to uh, develop this capability. And again, uh, with solar energy coming into the fore in terms of earth energy and going green, uh, this can only be, uh, you know, important to not just space exploration, but to the world. Next slide. Just a couple more to go. I think this is the last one. I just wanted to highlight that we have an amazing uh, summer internship program supporting the Australian National Indig Indigenous Space Academy. Uh, so uh, we've ha we had two interns from the Indigenous National Space Academy here this uh, last summer, not this summer. Um, we did preparation workshops at uh, UT Sydney, and then uh, they had research experience here at JPL. And so that was just a tremendously successful program. I went out and visited uh, the university uh, last year to really talk about how we continue that program and develop it and move it forward. But as Larry said, uh, exciting that next generation, giving them the opportunity to be a part of science and engineering, and then carrying that forward to a career that drives both our countries forward is really what we're all seeking. So with that, uh, I'll finish up last slide and I look forward to your questions. So Pam, back to you. Thank you so much, Larry. That was just fascinating. And uh, I, I particularly appreciated you highlighting the specific arrangements that exist uh, for working uh, on space science together between Australia and the United States. Uh, that, was, that was quite a comprehensive list and, um, and maybe a little surprising to some people with us today. Uh, so we received um, dozens, my, I might even say hundreds of questions. <laughs> Um, which uh, we've filtered through a little bit. And um, I'd like to start out with you, Megan. There um, is uh, some interest, I think, in uh, hearing a little bit more about access to space in Australia. And I, I understand congratulations are in order. You had a successful uh, launch from Australia. Uh, I believe it was suborbital um, just this week. And we'd like to hear a little bit more about your thoughts for the access to space in Australia, and perhaps uh, because you do carry the regulatory approach as well, your thoughts in that area. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Pam. Um, I, I think that, as I mentioned, you know, sovereign capability and capacity um, launch is so important in that it's one of our seven uh, priorities. We've got companies like Gilmore are working to build small uh, launch uh, capability. And, and I mentioned we have two locations um, that are pressing forward. So Equatorial Launch Australia looking to set up the Arnhem Space Centre in Northern Territory in a little peninsula there called uh, Nalamboy. 
and uh, and they're looking to work uh, with NASA. I'm working with NASA to do sounding rocket campaign just to uh, to get kicked off. So that's pretty exciting. And then Southern Launch, um, all credit uh, to to that team. Uh, looking for small satellite applications for polar launch from their orbital launch complex in Whalers Way, and then suborbital launch um, from the Kaniba test range. Uh, and uh, and just uh, did some test uh, tests with the Dart uh, their Dart rocket. Um, so there's the, you know there's some real excitement going on to be able to develop this ca capability. And then if we look at our responsibilities at the Australian Space Agency, it's really making sure that we're a responsible citizen, that we're safe, you know, safe on Earth, safe getting to space, safe in space, safe getting back home. Again, that's really important, and that we're responsible citizens in space. Um, so we knew that uh, we also needed to update our Space Act. It was one of the first things we did. I think we started in, uh, in 1st of July, two years ago in August. Uh, just after that, uh, uh, we managed to um, get approval through the, through the parliament um, of an update to our Space Act launches and returns. And then we, you, know, you spend a year making sure we have all the rules and framework um, for, for that, uh, that new legislation. And now we're working, we, work, we spent a lot of time in, in consultation with the industry as well, make sure that the rules were simple and understandable. And that was, uh, that was really useful feedback from the industry. We're now out um, implementing that. And as I said, we're now looking to gear up um, as, as, as if you look forward, you know, to make sure we can support the industry's plans for 40, 50, 60 um, repeat launches uh, a, a year. So, um, that's exciting for, for uh, us as well. And we're trying to, we're, you know, balancing um, the entrepreneurship and also being a responsible um, citizen in space. Yeah, thanks, Megan. That is really important with the terms of the Outer Space Treaty. Um, it, it is really important uh, to be seen as a responsible actor in space. I think that's uh, becoming increasingly important. So my next question would be for Larry Marshall. Um, I'd like to ask you, you, you talked a little bit about some of the research that you're working on. How do you see the role of universities, um, both from a research perspective, but also from a STEM preparation uh, standpoint? You know, Megan has talked about the space agency and the emphasis on building industry. How, how does the research enterprise uh, and universities and CSIRO play into that? Yes, so Pam, um, SIRO is a bit unique in the system. We're, we're by far the most connected um, organization in the innovation system, and that's very much by design. Um, and, and the reason we did that, so we work with every university, pretty much every research agency or institution, including medical to, to engineering, um, because we believe in the power of the network. Um, so Australia has some great um, individual researchers, but we're convinced when you connect them together, you, you, you grow that power exponentially. And, and, and that's how a small country, 24 million, 25 million people, can actually play strongly on the world stage. Um, when you think about how small our population is, it's surprising to see how many amazing achievements that we've done, including, including in space. So it's that power of the network. Um, and then probably over the last five years, um, we've, we've increased the number of students on all of our sites dramatically with well over 1400 students um, at any, any given time through the organization so that they can work not just on science for the, for the getting their university degree, but so they can work on something that's going to end up in the hands of industry, maybe even in the space industry. So they get more of a real taste of what it's like to actually work in that industry because we believe that will help um, strengthen the pathway. To, to employment. And then finally, missions. So two weeks ago at the press club, I announced a missions program through CSIRO. And this is a really, um, like the moon mission, um, but it, it's very specifically things that we can't do alone. You know, CSIRO is a big organization, but there's specifically things that we can't do alone that we absolutely have to collaborate broadly across the system to deliver. Things like eliminating plastic waste, things like um, figuring out how to, how to make create drought resilience in rural Australia. Um, things like uh, making a breakthrough on hydrogen energy. Um, this is the hydrogen cracker. It turns gaseous hydrogen into liquid renewable fuel, no emissions. And I would love you to use this on one of your rockets, Pam. <laughs> that would be fabulous. So, so, the, so the missions are all about Team Australia 
aiming at solving the big roadblocks, the big bottlenecks that are impeding our, our progress, whether it's climate change, um, droughts, um, bushfires, you know, manu advanced manufacturing, really trying to, to break down these barriers so that we can have economic growth, um, grow our way out of the current recession, we can have in, enhance our environment and our biodiversity, and we can improve quality of life, um, not just for us, but for everyone that we interact with, particularly our partners in the United States. Right, thank you, thank you. My next question is for uh, Larry James. Um, Larry, particularly given your background in defense before you came to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, you know, I think the relationship uh, between uh, NASA and defense um, uh, is, is of interest and uh, perhaps you could share some lessons learned and some thoughts about, um, you know, for Australia and for, for all of us going forward in terms of that partnership, how, how defense and civil space can work together. Sure. Well, I think as most of you probably know, I mean, when we set up NASA, it was our civil agency that was very distinct from any military or intelligence space operation. So there is that that distinction between them. We are we are for science. We're for civil purposes. But but obviously, we're all operating in the same domain. And so there has always been a partnership between NASA and the Department of Defense and the Air Force and the intelligence world, but primarily the DOD. Uh, in terms of just understanding what we're all doing, are there areas where we can operate together or develop technologies together? Are there areas where we can invest together because we have the same requirements? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Administrator Bridenstein just had a set down with uh, uh, General Jay Raymond, who's the commander of the Space Force or the chief of staff of the Space Force uh, earlier this week, and just talked about how we work together with now the Space Force and the Department of Defense on those areas that where it makes sense to work together. Uh, an example for us personally at JPL is we're working with the Air Force Research Lab to develop a next generation space flight computer, a high performance space flight computer. If you're in the space business, you kind of know the RAD 750 is the primary processor that many people use. It's RAD hard, but frankly, it's quite old. So we've developed a joint program with the Air Force because they have the same need that we do to go off and develop that next generation. So there's always opportunities, especially at the lower TRL levels. We need the same technology. We're flying in the same environment. Spacecraft generally have the same requirements in terms of pointing and power and those sorts of things. So it's, it's been a strong relationship, but there is always that demarcation between civil and defense. Right, different purposes, but it's a great point about uh, cooperation and research, especially Otherwise, you're just wasting research dollars by repeating work. So right, and there is there is a you know a, a, I think it's a quarterly meeting where NASA and the Air Force get together and they talk about those things at the Jim Bridenstine level. So you know it doesn't just you know happen willy nilly. It's 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 kind of a, a designed thing to make sure we're working together. Right. Thank you. Uh, Megan, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the role to uh, startups and small to medium enterprises in growing Australian space industry. Yeah, look, it's great that you highlighted that uh, area, Pam, because we've seen just um, kind of explosive growth uh, in the small to medium uh, enterprise area in the last few years, you know, some sort of 300% from a small, small base. And we're starting to see, as Larry was mentioning, um, Larry Marshall, you know, that the entrance of the venture capital um, industry examples, such as uh, the venture investment in Miriota. Uh, Miriota has some great technology for Internet of Things in space, you know, that's secure, it's low weight. Uh, so we're seeing um, those things come into play and, uh, and it is kind of exciting. And we're just starting. Uh, to look at uh, opportunities as well for all Australia missions. So the, uh, the, the agency just funded uh, first all Australia mission uh, with University of, of Melbourne, a CubeSat mission. And then in our international fund, we've also started to look at, you know, was really surprised at, at some of the ideas that came up. So, you know, new spacesuits um, working, uh, working on the basis of really Australia's um, sporting heritage in, you know, Kathy Freeman and Ian Thorpe and in pushing that envelope of, of, the, sort of, of the sort of suits um, and a, a company called Human Aerospace working on that. 
We've also looked at how, how we can use VR technology for astronaut training. Um, and so there's some really exciting stuff in that, in that new fund, just sort of small grants, but Ray Trace is looking for uh, you know, VR training simulator, um, uh, underwater training simulator for, for astronauts. Um, and, uh, and so we're starting to see some, even areas that uh, we didn't expect to, to, to come up in the, in the SME space. So a really vibrant SME space. Um, one of the reasons we chose to have our mission control in Adelaide um, is actually going to be open to the SME market. So not just um, support the Australian Space Agency in, in its mission control and, and joint and shared missions, uh, but we'll open it up to small companies so that they can, they can very quickly uh, track and, uh, and support getting their assets into space. Um, and then as they grow, of course, they may want to do that separately, but at least we can give them a leg up. So I, I would say one of the things that surprised us is just how um, exciting and robust this SME community uh, has been uh, in Australia. Yeah, I have to agree from my experience, Megan. I totally agree. Uh, next question is for Larry Marshall. I um, uh, wonder if you can talk a little bit about um, uh, space science and specifically what do you see as uh, the space science elements that might support the Moon to Mars program? Yeah, um, Megan said it well. Um, we're a small country, so we have to pick our, pick our foci very carefully, not boil the ocean. But we've had amazing history in material science. So you can't take your spare parts with you to Mars. Um, you'll need to print them there. And Australia and SORA in particular has been developing ways to turn regular old beach sand into titanium ink to fuel 3D printers to print unique um, titanium and other metal parts. This is a replacement sternum that saved a woman's life in New York a couple of years ago. Um, so being able to fabricate machine parts that actually you can use in space coming from these unique materials. You've also got to figure out um, how to get moisture from the soil and even how to farm very difficult soil. And I'll tell you the red earth of Mars from what I've seen looks a lot like the red soil of the Malabar or the Pilbara. <laughs> and and um, with combining an old, an old sorrow invention, which is um, polymer banknotes, um, we created a uh, liquid that you spray onto soil to trap the water and um, it even carries the fertilizer for the soil. This is really important because it, um, it about halves the water consumption. Remember I said twice the crops, half the water, um, but it also prevents the sedimentary runoff from, from the water, which is important to protect the barrier reef. So I just share those as examples where unique Australian technology in traditional industries like mining and, and agriculture apply very well to the surface of Mars where you need parts, you need to find water, and you need to grow food um, to stay there a long time. We're quite good at figuring that out. Um, for example, climate change should have reduced the yield of most Australian crops by up to 30%. But by cleverly breeding different strains of crops like wheat, we haven't gone down, we've actually gone up in yield. Um, and that's even with less water as well. So again, I think that knowledge in genetics and agriculture and then probably the final one is robotics. Um, again, mining is, uh, uses a lot of automation. You know, it, it breaks my heart that, that SARA has been flying autonomous drones for almost 25 years into the outback of Australia with an incredible um, autonomous control system. Probably could, could be one of the first in the world or one of the best in the world at the time. But of course, you know, we were doing it for environmental monitoring and for you know, for, for data gathering, it never, never occurred to us that anyone would want to drive an autonomous vehicle for another application. So I, I love poking around in the broom closets in Saro and in the university partners that we have, because it's extraordinary what you find. And a lot of the investments that um, we have done, including some that Megan mentioned, came out of that fossicking around in the broom closet, finding a piece of unique technology that no one quite knew what to do with but industry did if it was presented to them in the right way. That's our, that's our opportunity. There's so much there, as, as Megan said, we just got to get better at getting our hands on it and turning it into something real that someone can use. Right, well, certainly that's one of the benefits of having a space agency and also having a formal partnership that drives you to, th to think about those things. 
uh, couldn't agree more. And by the way, you get bonus points for show and tell. So you were able to <laughs> have your demonstration. <laughs> um, question for Larry that a lot of people seem to be very interested in. We talked an awful lot about technology today. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you think the uh, educational preparation that's going to be important for the future uh, to play a role in the space industry would be? Sure, and I think certainly it just aligns with what we've been talking about in many ways. Um, you know, it's everything from engineering, everything to science, from everything to data. Uh, those are kind of, I would say, writ large, kind of the three big things that we think about, right? We need the scientists to really help think about how do you do these things? What are the questions we need to answer? Uh, Certainly NASA as a space agency, we're very much about science and exploration. So science is extremely important. And thinking about, as, as Larry said, material science, and how can I make this material do something that I want it to do that it's never done before? So the science is absolutely essential. But then once you think, I need to answer this question, you need engineers that will somehow figure out, how do I build it? Uh, and, and that's a whole host of engineers, mechanical engineers, aerospace engineers, computer scientists, et cetera. Uh, so that's the other component. I think the last component, I talk a lot about this, is just the data. You know, for us, managing data well, uh, as these instruments start to just collect more and more data, we're launching a spacecraft called NISAR here in a couple years. We'll create about 85 terabytes of data per day looking down at the Earth. So how do you even deal with that? You know, you want to harvest the key important points from that data so we understand what's going on with the Earth. So if I was talking to someone today, I'd say, think about science or think about engineering or think about data. And I think all of, all, obviously those can give you pathways to all kinds of futures, but certainly from a space perspective, those are the key things that, that we are really searching for. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, data especially, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And that's just sort of an emerging uh, educational area right now as well. So we've run a little bit over, but this has been so wonderful and everybody wants to hang in there. But what I, I'd like to finish with is sort of a, a rapid fire question uh, for all three of you. If you'll just go uh, one at a time and um, you know, recognizing all the limitations, let's not worry today about politics and money. Let's hear an inspirational vision for what the Australia US uh, cooperation in space will look like 10 years from today. Give us, give us a snapshot of something aspirational uh, that we might be doing together. Megan? Well, uh, thanks, uh, Pam. And, and uh, we absolutely want to have a shared ambition uh, with our partners in the US and internationally. And, and when you think of that, uh, taking uh, missions of long, longer duration, um, even the, the living off our planet, um, the opportunity of, of discovering um, evidence of life off our planet. And, uh, uh, and I think our, our country, Australians being able to look up and see Australia participating to the full extent uh, in the space uh, sector um, and really bringing those technologies to everybody on Earth to just look back on our planet um, and care for it, care for it uh, in a perhaps better than we currently do, um, and also just improve the lives of, of really everyone around the world. Um, we'd love to be part of that as a country. Wonderful. Larry Marshall. So Australian school kids will be studying and hoping to go to uni to do degrees in space and space related technologies. Um, we'll be um, flying regularly between um, the Earth and the Moon and possibly even Mars. Um, we'll be helping you grow food and make parts on Mars. Um, you'll be using hydrogen fuel, renewable fuel created in Australia to get there. Um, and you, you'll solve Larry's problem about some um, solar panels with uh, 3D printed panels made in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> out of Australian material. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Larry James, give us a picture. Uh, I don't know if I can top that one, but, uh, you know, I mean, NASA's going back to the moon, right? In ideally in four years. And I can see in 10 years, Australia is a big part of that because we want to go back sustainably. 
So all the things that Larry talked about, sustainability on the moon is going to be extremely important and Australia will play a key role in that. So it's, you know, just one piece is uh, Australian sustainability capability with Australian astronauts on the moon living and working together with an international coalition. And how exciting is that for students to look up and say, there's two, 14 Australians up there at Moon Base X living right now. I want to do that. So I think that's a great aspirational view for our kids. Well, that's wonderful. I can tell you my aspiration is to see something like this, the Australian and the American flags together on the surface of the moon and Mars. And that's what I'm looking forward to seeing. Well, thank you all. You have been fantastic. What, what a fun panel, uh, all, all uh, dear friends and um, uh, incredible inspiration to everyone. Thank you for each and every one of you, uh, the contributions that you have made, not just uh, to your own country, but to global space exploration. And now I'd like to um, hand it over to uh, Jane Duke, who is the Consul General um, here in Los Angeles. Thank you so very much, Pam. And thank you to all the panelists for your truly fascinating conversation. You are each luminaries in your field and you've contributed so much to achievements that are literally out of this world. And it's been a privilege to learn about your vision and hear about the joint endeavors that you'll embark on in the future. As we've heard, there is a rich history of collaboration between Australia and the US on space, and there's a wealth of opportunities for our shared future. And for those of you who are tuning in who do not know me, I'm Jane Duke, and I'm Australia's new Consul General in Los Angeles. And it's been a real privilege as one of my very first things to do um, as part of uh, G'day USA, is to bring this panel to you through that platform. And today's event was one that we'd actually hoped to deliver in person earlier this year, but sadly the pandemic prevented this. But I'd like to thank the American Australian Association for hosting this event. Ambassador John Berry and his talented team have managed to support close to 900 viewer registrations today. And I'd also like to acknowledge and thank our G'day USA team and our partners, including the Australian Space Agency, CSIRO, Austrade, the Australian Consulate in LA, the Washington Embassy, and of course, NASA JPL. I'd expect that many of you who are watching have new ideas and interest in collaborating with one or more of these organisations based on what you've heard. So for those of you tuning in across different time zones and different parts of the US and Australia, it's been terrific to have you. Thank you so very much. And thanks again to our fantastic moderator, Pam, who pulled it all together uh, in a superlative way. Thank you.